Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar series held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. The NCC WSE Climate Change Science and Management webinar series highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and adaptation and aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts on fish and wildlife. Um, I would like to welcome Emily Fort, Data and Information Coordinator from the NCC WSC, to introduce today's speaker. Emily? Thanks, Ashley, and welcome, everybody. We're really happy to have you. Um, Tom Doyle is an ecosystem modeler with the USGS National Wetlands Research Center in Lafayette, Louisiana. His research focuses on ecosystem analysis and modeling with a special emphasis on climate reconstruction, forest growth and succession, floodplain inundation, and landscape habitat simulation. He has developed dozens of simulation models to investigate the role of natural and anthropogenic disturbance and climate change on marsh, forested wetland structure, and diversity of coastal and riverine ecosystems of the southeastern United States and the Caribbean region. His model applications focus on forecasting effects of sea level rise, hurricanes, altered freshwater flow, wastewater use, drought, and related aspects of ecosystem management and restoration. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom, and thanks so much. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that introduction. Um, today's presentation is on the sea level rise modeling handbook that was uh, commissioned through funding with the Southeast um, Climate Science Center uh, for the benefit of the, largely for the LCCs, landscape conservation cooperatives, and for DOI land managers and biologists um, uh, department-wide. And the goal of the project was to effectively uh, uh, produce a document that was an easy magazine-type read of an understanding of the science and simulation models related to uh, coastal, um, I mean, related to sea level rise uh, impacts on coastal ecosystems. So with that, we're given, I was given some other sort of commission with other um, assignments to help uh, do an effective job, at least of trying not to make the document ultra technical or designed for uh, of research scientists only, but for non-experts. And that involved uh, conducting a number of training sessions or feedback sessions with um, various offices, um, uh, agency offices across the northern Gulf Coast. And that included both state and federal uh, at that point because I was trying to be more um, inclusive than just DOI. And, and sort of expanded the effort to include uh, other agencies, Department of Defense, NOAA, um, uh, just NGOs and everything else, inviting them to the table to tell me uh, the kind of questions and needs they had for resource material or understanding of the, sea, the, the whole matter of sea level rise from a climate change perspective and the type of exercises or, or um, assignments that they were engaged in for which I could uh, basically uh, um, tailor the handbook for their best benefit. And the idea was that they would actually be able to sit down at, at a single read and read through it um, uh, essentially complete. And it started out with the goal of maybe 20 uh, pages, but I think it's more like 50 um, at this point. And uh, right now, for those of who are asking about what the status of that uh, product is, it is still in uh, USGS Fundamental Science Practices Review and um, is in final edits uh, by our Science Publication Network, Publishing Network. And they tell me that they think that it may be out in another month or two as they complete some uh, last minute uh, or final edits and uh, formatting for the document. So uh, we'll find a way to to uh, get it distributed to uh, 
folks as, as it becomes available as an online link and electronic document as a USGS professional papers series. Um, so uh, the, there are two major divisions in the handbook outline, um, the first of which, uh, major divisions, uh, first of which is understanding uh, sea level change. And in that section, uh, I basically cover some of the uh, tools and methodologies for reconstructing and observing uh, sea level uh, rise related to, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of break that outline down further. The second major component are the various uh, tools, decision support tools and models and databases and, and the like that have been used for simulating sea level rise effects on coastal ecosystems. And so that will be the latter half of this presentation by way of, of example uh, used in the deal. So uh, with understanding sea level change, to make sure the leadership, readership actually kind of understands where we've been and where we're going in the respect of how to use or how these models have been used and what um, value they represent, um, we go through a basic understanding of the Earth's hydrosphere, and that is that basically the volume of water that's in our hydrosphere, um, Earth's hydrosphere is, is uh, finite. And that, but the form of that water, it, the different types that it can take, is dynamic, meaning more in ice or less in uh, more in ocean or less on, la on land, as I'll show. Secondly, uh, just different uh, methodologies and the understanding that we have of the effects of of uh, plate tectonics, uh, glaciation, and um, ice melt um, on the rise and fall of sea level affected mostly by the change in size of ocean basins, the impact of planetary cycles, and uh, the more recent um, melt um, uh, period of record. And then uh, I'll, I'll take uh, a section that's on the contemporary sea level record that basically uh, highlights the, uh, the value and uh, the uh, of tide gauge records uh, long term and also the more short term but more recent satellite altimetry uh, records and effectively show how those records while often reported as being in, uh, different or expressing different rates of sea level are actually more compatible than than people might realize it. I hope to cover some of that during this presentation as well as the um, how used together tell us a lot more about the land motion um, aspects and subsidence of, of uh, different uh, coastal um, uh, sectors of the coast. And then lastly in this section talk about the National Climate Change uh, Assessment of 2012 where we now have new future projections for sea level, which are uh, used in, in most models in some form or fashion to uh, basically uh, uh, project the, the potential change of sea level. So we start with the Earth's hydrosphere, which is, is, is a finite water supply, but the question is, uh, in what, where, is it in, in the, uh, where is it in the hydrosphere? 97% or three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by water in our ocean basin. So that's the largest percent. The rest of it that you see on this, sh on this sheet with regards to the uh, glacial ice sheets, um, that uh, portion that's stored uh, in the terrestrial component on land uh, surface and groundwater and surface water is less than 3%. And it's that 3% that fluctuates between um, ice uh, conditions um, that account for over uh, something on the order of 120 meters of rise and fall in the, the glaciation cycles that I'll mention more of, about here uh, shortly. And yet, uh, one of the uh, things that I uh, highlight in this paper is that when we hear about climate change projections, not just for sea level, but for, say, uh, temperature or precipitation, one of the questions people should ask if they 
are hearing that a given region or sector of the coast is going to become drier as, as a relation as a function of, of, of precipitation record that you might be asking well where is it getting wetter because we water is like energy it's neither created nor destroyed it just changes form the major um, changes that account for uh, sea level rise, of course, are the volumetric uh, change of input from ice melt, uh, and then the other effect is its actual temperature effect on water expansion. Because we found in the reference material that we use to prepare the report different uh, values for uh, the degree of expansion that can be expected for, say, a one degree change in ocean temperatures, uh, over a thousand meters of depth. Uh, we actually include in the handbook a appendix uh, on the um, functions of how water uh, volume changes with mass and with temperature. And uh, not so much that uh, um, people actually try to use it, but they'll know where this information comes from. And as you can see, uh, water volume for the same mass of fresh water and salt water is actually uh, different. Here you have salt water at 35 parts per thousand compared to fresh water at zero parts per thousand. And this, given that they're at the same mass, um, they actually occupy a different volume. And then if you add a component of added uh, temperature, meaning that warmer water basically takes up more volume than colder water. And so to answer the question that I started with, which is uh, using these functions that um, are included in the appendix, one degree change in ocean temperature over a thousand meters for um, an average um, ocean temperature of 17 degrees, going from 17 to 18, actually represents a 23.03 centimeter rise in sea level. So that just sort of explains that whole effect. And while it may not seem um, uh, plausible to think in terms of multi-millions of years in terms of effects of uh, change in sea level, but the configurations of our ocean basins are affected by the plate uh, tectonic movements of our land masses. And so as they break up or, or consolidate uh, over this type of period, they've actually been um, uh, causing differences in uh, ocean uh, depths uh, in such a way that over the longer period leading up to the late Cretaceous period, its ocean volumes, I mean the ocean basin was decreasing, but over that longer time period has now been increasing. And this represents two different methodologies using sediment stratigraphy of, of the um, from two different studies by Hack and others, 87, Comins et al. in 2008, um, utilizing sort of different methods of interpreting the sediment stratigraphy, but both basically showing uh, ex uh, the same pattern of, of history of decreasing and increasing um, ocean basin volume uh, over time, even though they're kind of different in magnitude and timing. The other um, major effect that uh, we see now in a world of, of glaciation and over the period of the uh, last uh, half million years of Pleistocene epoch, uh, we have uh, good data on uh, various uh, <clears throat> aspects of our um, uh, environment, both in terms of uh, oxygen isotopes that are taken for uh, foraminifera um, 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 specimens in the ocean depths that uh, can be used to basically uh, interpret uh, sea level heights. And this has been done multiple times. This is the first graph showing you basically the effect of the planetary cycle of a Milankovitch time period of approximating 90 to 100,000 um, years of uh, cooling and warming of the Earth um, related to the orbital cycle. 
And so you're seeing four different cycles over this 400 plus year cycle. And then more currently um, here in um, the contemporary time, we're uh, just gone through <clears throat> ice melt that um, has us again at a high sea level rise condition and <clears throat> what we refer to as a high stand in contrast to a low stand when the earth is cooled down and, and more of that water is back in an ice cap covering uh, largely north northern hemisphere. And additional data sources of ice volume <clears throat> um, layers and concentrations of CO2 gases all correspond or concomitant with this long um, uh, history and pattern of the effect of glaciation on our um, sea levels. So it wasn't but 12,000 years or less than 20,000 years ago that sea levels uh, were 120 meters below current. And um, so, and they, they're up for a period of time before we can expect them to rise. Although <clears throat> with the increase of CO2 uh, in, in 400 parts uh, per million, as they are currently at this time, um, that that's part of the driving um, aspect of a greenhouse effect and the fact that there's still one to 60 meters of available freshwater ice, I mean, in ice that uh, has the potential to melt uh, without uh, the advent of another uh, icing effect. So then we look more currently in the Holocene record and there are a number of these. We pulled this example from Valsley and Donahue 2004, uh, largely because it's a reconstruction of, of a number of sources of data from the different ocean uh, systems globally, uh, from the Pacific to the Red Sea to the Caribbean, uh, looking at both foraminifera, um, 18 uh, sample material and uh, corals. Uh, the same could be taken from uh, carbon dating from mangrove peats and other things where this corresponding curve uh, of the ice melt of the last uh, 20,000 years since the last glacial maximum basically is, is replicated quite beautifully with a number of different types of <clears throat> biological and geological data sets. Uh, for the most part. And here again, we're at a current high stand of, of um, sea level uh, that's been fluctuating and has influenced marine terracing along our coastline. And um, uh, so anyway, this is um, part of the, uh, the confidence that we have that uh, uh, of the, some of the factors, both in terms of uh, uh, planetary uh, cycles and uh, orbital cycles that uh, contribute to uh, sea level rise. Uh, then we bring it up to more contemporary sea level rec uh, record of the last 100 or 200 years for which we have uh, numerous long-term tide gauge records that have been identified in geologically stable environments. That means that the land um, um, uh, component uh, is not necessarily moving either by uh, uplift or by or sinking, such that um, a reliable estimate of long-term uh, uh, sea level rise is on the order of one to two uh, millimeters per year, and then you see an overlap of the shorter satellite record of about the last 22 decades, and in many cases is reported at a global mean um, sea level of, of about 3.3 or 4 millimeters per year. And many times this is reported as an evidence of acceleration of sea level rise in contrast to long-term tide gauge records. But as part of this handbook and our exercise, is to show that uh, it matters how you compare uh, different rates and different methods and that there are uh, some uh, 
rules that are best applied. And so, first of all, that each coastline, uh, aside from the used to see uh, factors that we've talked about in terms of ocean volume, ice melt, and thermal expansion of sea level, which we're calling the used to see aspect, there are other factors that are different uh, related to the astronomical and meteorological conditions that account for a change in sea level height together with a change in surface elevation, which can be affected as a function of the land subsiding or deposition on the land or the tilt of the land of the landform or the um, larger land mass as a function of isostatic rebound or glacial rebound from uh, relief of ice weight on on the on the system is one another example. It's the combination of both this change in sea height and land height that makes up for an effective sea level rise at a given location or a local, what's called a local or relative mean sea level. And so that is different for every location uh, for all those factors that are involved. And as a case example used in the handbook, we look at relative sea level rise for the Gulf the northern Gulf Coast, where they share the same coastline and are fairly proximal to each other um, and or the same uh, body of water. And here we have the example of Pensacola in northwest Florida on a stable geology that approximates that same long-term trend that I showed in the earlier slide on the order of two millimeters per year in contrast with uh, the Louisiana Delta Plain of the Mississippi River Grand Isle, which is even five times more um, uh, greater than the Pensacola at around 10 millimeters per year or one centimeter per year rate, in contrast to Galveston, Texas on the Chenier Plain, which also has a high rate of sea level rise, not as much. And uh, I'm going to make a little bit of a point here to show that part of a discovery is of doing this uh, handbook and, and putting together the illustrations is that Galveston is less about a natural effect of alluvial deposits uh, compacting as it is about uh, removal of groundwater causing subsidence uh, records that are well known for the Houston Galveston areas respect to uh, um, uh, roads and, and uh, housing constructions. So if we look at the uh, more contemporary or the more recent uh, satellite record over the last uh, two decades, uh, the U.S. Topex, Poseidon, and Jason satellite missions are, were commissioned at different times over this period and are combined into a, com a, a comprehensive record over this period and um, you're seeing basically a 10-week record for each one of these points where the satellites uh, uh, are basically doing a, a measurement from space as opposed to a tide gauge uh, on the shoreline and reading the water level from the basin or from the water uh, from the bottom up. This is from the top down of electromagnetic pulses that are sent to the Earth and the fact that it's rather than being stationary like a tide gauge basically in the same harbor or same location, the satellites are always on a track but not necessarily sampling from the same specific location of the ocean but always gathering some level of information of, of the height of the uh, ocean body. And so here you see that the trend over this 20-year record, which is uh, approximate to a 19-year uh, tidal epoch, which in effect uh, provides some of the variation that you can expect astronomically due to all the arrangements of the gravitational forces of the moon and, and the planetary alignments um, that uh, this provides you sort of this uh, counting that we see, which is the 3.4 millimeters per year slope 
in the record. And uh, the European community also has a, a, a satellite called Advizo, and we, we also downloaded and stripped the data for this as well to compare with the U.S. Uh, Topex, Poseidon, Jason merge set that I just showed you. And basically, the two sets are very compatible. In some cases, the Advizo fills in data gaps for their satellite with the U.S. record, but both are, are basically uh, providing a lot of confidence that these um, records um, are genuinely providing a, uh, a good measurement of the uh, um, change in cell, uh, sea, um, ocean or sea height altimetry uh, over this period of time of record. Again, the same uh, rate uh, on the order of 3.42 or thereabouts uh, for this 10-week uh, remeasurement record uh, that's needed. So I'm going to make the point and, and show again in the record that tide gauge and satellite records are very compatible, but in doing so, you have to be talking about rectifying to the same datum so that they um, are compatible in, in the sense of of the reference that you're uh, referring to, that you're actually comparing the same time periods um, involved, and that your records are complete, that there are no data gaps. So this is a problem where when looking at tide gauge records uh, over the um, continent or for any given location, uh, NOAA has historically uh, re uh, calculated the sea level trends for many of these more permanent gauges that you see along the coastline of of North America and um, and such and and but here in this case uh, I've I've trimmed the record to look at the same period of record as the satellites so that you get basically a fair uh, analysis or comparison between gauges and between satellites. And as you can see, there are evidence of records that of sea level that is actually falling effectively, not so much because we're losing uh, used to sea in the oceans, but because the land is lifting that much faster uh, over this same time period. In other cases, the degree of sea level rise on a regional basis is less or more depending on the location. And again, the, the component that tide gauges include is the not only the used to see aspect, but what's happening in terms of the land motion aspect of whether it's subsiding or uplifting. So if we go back to the uh, Gulf of Mexico uh, example of sites, if we attempt to detrend the and isolate the, um, the degree of which part is how much these gauges are representing a land motion change, we have to convert the satellite record from a 10-week record to a monthly record, which actually adjusts the rate again to 3.32 millimeters per record uh, per year. And in fact, for the same period of record. The gauges of the Gulf of Mexico, around the Gulf of Mexico, Key West, Pensacola, Grand Isle, and Galveston are all rising at a faster rate than the sea level. And for many people, this is a confusing um, element that we wanted to bring into the education of this, in this handbook was that uh, the long-term record for these gauges is a much slower uh, rate of sea level rise, but for the same comparative period, these gauges are actually rising, uh, showing a rise effect uh, greater than the satellites. The difference of which is some degree of land motion uh, that can be attributed to either local subsidence or the tilt of the landform or some other things that I, we don't explain here. And then if we look at the uh, tidal epic period of prior to 1994-2012, going back in time, we basically see that there are rates uh, 
greater or lesser and comparable to the current rate so that effectively uh, this might imply that there's really not that strong an evidence for an absolute acceleration or deceleration that it's more or less um, um, holding similarly for this period of record. And uh, the contrast, again, going back to Galveston, is that you have some periods of record where there are even higher uh, rates of sea level, which are more about the land motion effect, which in this case is a period of time post-World War II and prior to um, some local recognition of subsidence rates um, uh, related to groundwater withdrawal. And here you're seeing that there's evidence of the influence of man of different subsidence rates that, uh, that I associate with more with the groundwater withdrawal effect than, um, than, a, than anything that's a property of the compaction of the types of sediments um, in those locations. The, uh, and then when you look at just the Key West record uh, against without the uh, satellite record or a re residual satellite record, you see the same thing I showed before, but you, we tried to, we illustrate this with uh, both linear and curvilinear fits and so that there is a, a land motion effect that can, uh, even though it's a stable geology, same with Pensacola, which is about the same rate. And then for Grand Isle, Louisiana, the fact that while, uh, again, we, we expecting to see a more constant uh, residual rate due to subsidence of deltaic uh, components. The early part of this record is relatively flat, flat with a curvilinear acceleration here toward the end. There's no, I'm not offering any explanation. I'm just showing that this is the value and use of both gauge records and satellite records that are more compatible in um, with each other than what uh, in many cases has been reported. And then Galveston uh, for the more recent uh, tidal epic for this period, 1994, having a, a reduced uh, uh, land motion effect, it's, it's, it's almost similar to uh, Pensacola and, and Key West, meaning that there are some evidence that uh, due to uh, restricted groundwater withdrawal, they have, that rate has slowed down. Uh, for the benefit of modeling, um, uh, there's the need to have the future sea level rise projections that are generated from climate models, general circulation models, and uh, to look at the potential range of, of possibilities, in this case, um, from the lowest, which is a two uh, millimeter per year record, which is sort of business as usual or the um, historic record uh, extended in the future, which is the uh, low case um, scenario, which it's only likely to be at least that much or more. And then uh, some intermediate um, possibilities of 0.5 and up to 1.2 millimeters. And in some cases adjusted in the 2012 above uh, previous IPC reports of 2001 and 2007 as high as two uh, meters uh, uh, over the next century uh, or by 2100. And so these are the kind of projections that uh, many of um, land managers or in municipal uh, coastal planners and uh, practitioners are concerned about and trying to make uh, uh, adaptation plans and strategies for uh, in lieu of. And so the kind of, of uh, there's a range of different types of predictive models for sea level rise that are highlighted in the report and then for the way we categorize them or um, uh, identify them by their properties uh, and characteristics 
um, we've established about six different types of groups of, of models from sea level rise, simulation, and inundation models that are largely uh, about the change in hydrology, uh, GIS sea level rise mapping tools, which is uh, basically uh, decision support tools that are built on GIS capacities of land over uh, water over land uh, predictions, uh, wetland change models, which incorporate uh, habitat uh, considerations in terms of uh, ability to keep pace or, to, or the relationships that can affect what type of habitat precedes another habitat under different submergence rules. There are a class of, of tools and methodologies for um, observing uh, surface elevation and shoreline change. Uh, we talk about those models as well as sort of a group. Then there's sort of an evolving uh, group of models called niche-based or species distribution models that um, are based more on climate envelope considerations of change in temperature and precipitation, but also sea level. And then more sophisticated ecosystem models that deal with leaf to landscape uh, predictive capability of, of species um, and organism level uh, changes in terms of uh, uh, effects of, of uh, at the leaf layer all the way to the landscape uh, through the stand level where um, uh, changes in CO2 in the atmosphere and everything else can have uh, some feedback effect in these models along with the uh, direct impacts of flooding from sea level rise. So the layout of the different um, model groups that I've just identified are put out in basically table uh, uh, attribute tables by each group. In this case, you're looking at the uh, sea level rise uh, simulation inundation models, and we did our best to be as uh, exhaustive or comprehensive in search of uh, the literature and internet and what whatnot to uh, categorize and, and to describe some of these different models. And here you see sort of this collective uh, group that's identified and what agency or organization um, has has developed the model, what kind of scale does it operate at, um, what is its uh, spatial resolution if it's identified, on what temporal scale does it operate, what are some of the input parameters that are required to, uh, to run the model or to uh, produce output, and what are the output parameters of the model, and then what are the citations in terms of where can I learn more about that model. And in the, in the body of the handbook are some um, abbreviated descriptions of each of these uh, models that are illustrated. One thing that's not included that was asked for in both the um, free handbook uh, feedback sessions with uh, partners across the Gulf Coast and thereafter um, was could you add a component of, of how a good or um, how well the models perform and things like that, which got into more of whether we could actually test, evaluate, or, or do a sensitivity analysis on the models, which was not either possible and it was not within the scope of the project. But one of the things that continues to come up because people want to read about these different models but have someone's expert opinion or a process that gives them sort of like a, a review of goods um, that we might do when we buy um, TV or some other appliance that you want to know how, does it, how do they stack up against each other. And that's not included. There's nothing like that included in this report. So among the sea level rise simulation inundation models uh, that are highlighted in the, in, the, in the handbook, I can illustrate easily the SLURP sea level rise rectification program as one step through of how um, the models are described. 
basically this is a model that I that I developed for a Department of Transportation Gulf Coast um, uh, study where they wanted to know how different uh, transportation sector um, uh, features um, and uh, assets could be impacted by sea level rise. That would be rail, roads, ports, harbors, and what would elevation are those um, assets at? And then if choosing a near approximate gauge uh, location, the model uses historic um, observed data from the tide gauges, allowing a user to specify uh, uh, or accept a historic condition or customize it with a new subsidence or eustatic rate that, general, that effectively uh, creates a projected sea level rise with all the um, numerical attributes of monthly uh, astronomical and meteorological record, which is real, into the future above what the trend line was for that gauge over that period of record. And so, uh, in this case, the, the user could select a, a global uh, change scenario or do a customized deal. But basically, if, if the feature that they're looking at, wetland or rail or road, was at a one meter elevation in AVD 88, this model rectifies both the water level record and the, and the orthometric level of the land surface or the, or the feature together so that we're, we're you're dealing with apples and apples. And it shows you basically at what point for that given climate scenario or sea level scenario that is selected that it might take 36 years or year 2036 before you get a, a, a monthly or multiple monthly uh, inundation of that feature. Uh, and then again, because of the variability, maybe without for a period of months or years, and then eventually over a 30 year or longer time period before you'd actually get to the point where that feature would be permanently or subsequently submerged over, over the, the time period compromised. Of the G GIS sea level rise mapping tools, these are the ones that basically use uh, uh, data uh, sources that are readily available. These are also known as the bathtub models. These are visualization tools that uh, effectively use some understanding of elevation of the landform uh, and a um, aspect of some arbitrary, generally arbitrary water level that's unrectified, it, it doesn't matter that it's uh, what the rectification is or what the uh, uh, datum is, reference datum necessarily, they're, they're kind of arbitrarily pulled together and effectively just says that whenever this water level condition exceeds a, uh, a land elevation uh, basis, whatever source, national elevation data set, LIDAR, it can be um, whatever source. And these are three primary examples, the new NOAA Sea Level Viewer, University of Arizona Map Visualization Tool, and the USGS Sea Level Rise uh, animations that I can kind of show you visually and are described in the section on these models. And there's more of them than what I'm just showing, but these are good ones that are used and have been developed with pretty refined capacities. And so you're seeing a window here as you um, execute the uh, program on the NOAA Sea Level Viewer. It allows the viewer to, to uh, increase the uh, sea level rise uh, effect up from one to six feet in depth. There's some other features uh, that uh, allow you to, to effectively uh, um, uh, simulate sort of a marsh accretion and a few other things. And then it gives you a resultant uh, field of view of where that flood extent and that shoreline extent would take place in a, uh, in a future condition with that kind of, in this case, six feet sea level rise uh, mode. So these are very handy tools that are very um, 
work very well and are probably of more value education-wise to sort of appreciate uh, what could happen uh, more than what might technically happen at those specific locations. It has a lot of assumptions about hydrologic connectivity and things that I'm not going to go into. The same for the University of Arizona web map visualization, uh, a good tool that uh, they keep making a few changes to sort of make some of the water um, aspects a little more rectified to the land datum and, and the like, but basically it's a water over land approximation that doesn't have a lot of the understanding of the biology or the geology of the location. It just sort of mat uh, does an overlay uh, exercise of the data sets themselves. Um, same for the USGS sea level rise animations with a little more uh, socioeconomic uh, considerations of population levels that may be impacted and um, other aspects of highways and, and cities and such, and a much broader range of, of um, sea level potential uh, in terms of rise potential that um, can sort of dramatize the whole effect, in this case, up to six meters, which is well above um, current IPCC uh, sanctioned sea level rise projections, but are, we're within the range of plausibility if we have some serious ice melt conditions that may result. The next class of models described in the handbook are the wetland change models that basically consider the specific habitat type. Don't have any kind of species level um, or organizational level at, at the, uh, at the uh, local um, plant or uh, necessary level, but it, it, with generic sort of habitat types that are um, described often in the various sources of information that are used like National Wetland Inventory uh, data or uh, TEM imagery, these models basically incorporate a, a rule set of potential changes of, of habitat switching, as it's often called, from one type to another due to the, uh, based on the degree or change in land surface submergence. So the Coastal Ecological Landscape Spatial Simulator has a long history and has been used in a number of different watersheds, and I think it's still in production mode for application, but basically uses a mass balance approach to the exchange of hydrology from cell to cell and uses a fairly generic uh, salt water fresh um, in swamp uh, conditions, and again, a, a relatively rudimentary, but uh, something more than just water over land um, um, process to sort of affect change. And it has other features about it in terms of, of um, uh, potential for subsidence or for accretion processes to occur in these uh, select habitats that um, uh, can be used in the, in the output. Uh, a, a fairly um, a uh, common model now being used and, and uh, adopted by certain agencies and <clears throat> NGOs as uh, a very uh, utilitarian um, um, and very visible or, or um, model with display functions and everything else so that uh, you can sort of see the, a, 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 a more comprehensive range of habitat types and it has a little more complicated rule set um, that can be applied of how one habitat under a given submergence condition can either accrete and keep pace or doesn't keep pace with sea level but converts from one type to another and is widely used as the SLAM model. And uh, so uh, another version but not a space, uh, it's spatial but it's more based on functional attributes of why you have salt marshes in certain locations of, 
of a certain tidal range. It's a sea level over proportional elevation model slope, and it basically considers how the different uh, relative sea level conditions at a given coastal reach, in this case at a county level, for um, salt marsh uh, effectively shows the displacement that would take going up slope uh, of that habitat type in a functional design that's quite elegant for regional and national level scale uh, application to kind of project how much of the land form um, and how much marsh migration would take place uh, upslope uh, under these circumstances. Surface elevation shoreline erosion models, we, we highlight a, a number of different uh, types. They're not necessarily used quite in the same way to predict uh, a change in shoreline or I'm not a sort shoreline, but habitat uh, condition at a park or regional scale, but um, are tools that um, are used in other aspects of research or making predictions for shoreline change that are very important to uh, uh, land managers at the moment. And, and the two that I'm going to highlight but not necessarily exclude others is the coastal vulnerability index and the surface elevation tables and briefly you introduce to that, but other methodologies like marsh geochronology which uses season 137 or lead to 10 dating to get an idea of whether marshes are keeping pace and what kind of accretion rates are there or salt marsh stratigraphy and evolution models which basically are, are keeping up with the um, uh, regression or transgression of a coastal interface at a marsh and trying to make predictions based on the amount of, of subsidies of sediment and the properties of the species involved to accrete uh, organically. And then tidal channel network models. We introduced some of that. We're looking at how, as sea level rises, how it affects um, the hydrology component of erosion within these small tidal channels uh, at the uh, coastal interface. The Coastal Vulnerability Index is a USGS product, uh, but basically is, utilizes the empirical information that's already available in, a, in historic map sets dating back hundreds of years of shoreline change and essentially pro, uh, projects probability indexes for degree of erosion uh, at a, a meter per year uh, rate, and so you immediately get a larger view at the regional or, or coastal um, view of what shorelines are more stable and um, uh, and others that are more erodible. And uh, this is a, another model type that we kind of describe. A, a technique that's being widely distributed now um, at, at you know, both by different agencies, state and federal, and NGOs for uh, different landforms is the surface elevation table, which effectively is a benchmark driven down into the substrate of, of wet, on wetland soils, equivalent to a, a benchmark on land that can be monitored and re-leveled over time to determine how much it's subsiding over those periods of records at different depths and because it uses a reference from up top of, of um, distance down to the marsh surface or whatever surface it is, pond or other, that over time you can uh, capture the rate of accretion and sedimentation that's going on with the, with the inclusion of marker horizons. So some of that information is also provided. Niche-based species district models say basically that um, each species has a unique climate condition for which it, it's most optimum in its range and it's tied to um, a particular uh, uh, precipitation or temperature record. And um, while that's a, a concept that is driving some models to look at continental scale change as temperature uh, or projections of 
temperature um, or done over continental scale. This is an example of a species that is uh, basically attuned to uh, sea level condition more than it is to a necessarily a climate uh, precip or temperature range. And this is bald cypress. And a lot of this was worked out of, through some research studies I was involved in, but I think it gives a good illustration of how um, at a given elevation contour you can find the larger extent and how that ties into the history of the geologic era of the late Pleistocene when the coastal plain uh, was largely shaped and um, that uh, sea level sort of drives uh, Cypress upslope and they persisted over this time period uh, accepting for conditions and more arid conditions in, in the uh, Texas side of the system and perhaps due to glacial aridity um, in the northeast section. These, so these are uh, alternative uh, model to, models that I think are going to be important. And here's another example from work looking at geologic record of evidence of mangrove that we think of as nearly just tropical in Florida, but there's record of increasing um, evidence or um, expansion of mangroves northerly, both in the northern hemisphere here in the U.S. and even in the southern hemisphere. And so the geologic record says that the earth was warm enough in the Eocene period that it could have, I mean, that mangroves expansion was much further than what it is even today. And that these, this level of information and these kinds of models will make uh, our understanding of, of how our um, uh, land units can be changed over time. An example of a, of a niche-based model for climate envelope is another mangrove model that uh, basically is looking at how temperature limits um, growth or, or expansion and that freezes that uh, basically injure tropical plants, in this case mangroves, uh, has an impact. But in a future climate when it's going to be more uh, warm, uh, it can be expected that um, different scenarios of sea level can allow for greater or lesser expansion of mangroves replacing temperate salt marshes as we move north. Last model, set of models are the leaf to landscape models. I know I'm pushing time. I hope you'll stay with me. The wetlands, selvan, mangrove models, which basically are operating at a plant level, predicting how one plant can shade another, how leaf uh, function uh, both photosynthetically and or the effect of CO2 in the atmosphere, along with uh, other factors at the site or uh, landscape level like sea level rise and flooding conditions, temperature can all impact um, species distribution on the landscape. In this case, a uh, species-based um, occurrence um, nomogram for northwest Florida for these different types, basically showing where the zone of, of interface between marsh and um, forest ecotone and where uh, impact of storm tides and high uh, salinity wash have uh, led to impact of, of uh, dieback in these systems. And effectively, this uh, information was used in a habitat matrix probability context to push sea level upslope over the period of record, basically showing how marsh would migrate at a species level and replace and or impact uh, the interface with um, the freshwater um, forested uh, systems and what that might mean in terms of area. A more sophisticated model at the stand level dealing with individual regeneration patterns and, and individual tree orientation in terms of uh, shade impacts is the mangrove model connected with the Selva model, the two working hierarchically across in a, a up and down scale from the leaf to the landscape, uh, effectively being able to predict how 
uh, mangroves would move upslope uh, in a higher sea level condition and replace uh, freshwater marshes, salinity, and and seawater uh, moved upslope. So the 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 uh, handbook basically is laid out with this larger understanding and, and information about um, uh, the history of sea level in a geologic context, the more recent context of how we are observing sea level with tide gauges and satellite uh, information and how that information is actually more compatible than, than some people have made it sound as though, and uh, the various types, different kinds and details characteristics of the different kinds of models that are being applied uh, to look at the impact of potential sea level, future sea level on uh, our um, ecosystem, coastal ecosystems at a park, region, or continental scale. So uh, I'm hoping that this uh, handbook that uh, has basically uh, um, been peer-reviewed but it's still in some format and editing changes is going to be released at sometime in August 2014. And um, my credits and thanks to the Southeast uh, uh, Climate Science Center, I got that backwards, sorry about that, uh, for funding this work and for um, setting up the webinar uh, presentation. So that concludes my um, presentation if, if by chance there's an opportunity to take questions. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in already. One from Kimberly, and it says, do high and low points on the satellite correspond with tides? Also, are the subsistence rates reflected on the statistics from page 17 tidal gauge ranges? Okay, so the first question is, do high and low points on satellite correspond with tides? Well, I, I wouldn't use the word tides, but the uh, correspondence between um, tide gauge records and the satellite record is, is, it fits very well in terms of the seasonal and uh, uh, most points. The, uh, we attempted to try to isolate um, a record near shoreline which would correspond with each of the gauges and basically um, the Gulf of Mexico as a whole is a bathtub and you can use readily one gauge to effectively predict another one very good for this monthly record of both the tide gauge and, and satellite record as a whole and so yeah they they line up and uh, correlate very highly. Is land moving up when tide is going up? I'm not real sure how to answer that. Um, um, water, there's a degree of which the water is going up that the tide gauges, I mean that the satellites are, are recording, the tide gauges are, are, are showing the same thing. It's just that at the same time or over the same period, those tide gauges may actually be going through a, a more localized process of sinking or even uplifting. Okay, and then um, we have another question from, sorry, scrolling back up here, from John, and it says, what causes the large annual scale fluctuations in sea level in the satellite data? Uh, those are all uh, the seasonal trends um, of water where in the Gulf of Mexico you have uh, the warmer waters and in some cases you're looking at storm uh, effects from hurricanes and other things that uh, effectively you know, are moving water, but basically this is a seasonality effect of colder water, warmer water. Okay, and then we have a question from Sean. It says, does the manual discuss the relative reliability of different methods of modeling? No, you mean in terms of like a, 
either a sensitivity analysis or a certainty analysis kind of thing. There's there's uh, there's no um, in-depth uh, evaluation of the models themselves, like the code or the uh, properties of how they function uh, are not are not treated in the in the uh, handbook. Only the uh, functionality of the models and the characteristics of their makeup and their use and their um, in some cases mo the models have gone through a validation or verification and there's a note um, to that aspect or whether they're unverified meaning uh, no hindcast or other type of, of exercise was done to show that the results are can be reasonably, um, uh, you know, trusted or, or value, uh, accepted. Okay, uh, you want me to hand watch these uh, uh, from Nicole Metzger. Um, she says many of the tools shown are specific to the Gulf and Atlantic coast, where sea level rise levels can be simply added, and the resultant inundation map to the new elevation contour to produce reasonable results. Uh, however, on the west coast and Pacific coast, run-up dominates the coastal flood hazards. Run-up is not linearly proportionate. In other words, you cannot simply add sea level rise to the still water levels to estimate the effect of future scenarios. The engineering analyses must be recalculated using the new still water level inputs and may result in very different responses at the shoreline. What tools are available to address the effects of sea level rise effects on the Pacific coast? I think the same would apply to the run-up of, of surge bubbles uh, from hurricanes in the Gulf Coast, which was um, it is beyond the scope of the of the uh, handbook uh, to deal with um, uh, phenomenal um, sea level change effects of days or, or hours or whatever uh, effectively as opposed to the long-term uh, impacts or effects of, of sea level rise uh, necessarily. So I, I would agree with you that even on a regional level, if I showed you the satellite record for the um, Pacific coast, um, the, the Sea level, eustatic sea level record is, is actually closer to zero, although that's not what's commonly reported since more of the water uh, conditions of the Pacific Atlantic are tro over tropical waters where it's, it's a more comparable rate to the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you. Um, and is there any data for Hawaii and other coastal territories? Well, when you say data, uh, um, I mean, the, there's tide gauge records um, uh, for Hawaii, and um, I mean that that that's true worldwide. There's uh, locations of tide gauges that are uh, monitored by or maintained by different uh, nationalities or or uh, organizations are largely reported in um, the uh, permanent mean sea level. Uh, database and uh, website, so they're available publicly to download, just as the NOAA gauge information, NOAA tides online or uh, historic information for their gauges can be downloaded from NOAA's site um, as well. So um, yeah, there's records for Hawaii, and then of course for the satellite, you'd have to strip the data that kind of overlays the portion of the Pacific around Hawaii to kind of uh, contrast those sets of records. Okay, thank you. And then question from Walter, it says, in view of the increased attention to sea level rise and climate change, is there any effort to standardize by convention a common datum? Well, I don't know that there, you mean, in a global sense, I don't, I don't know that there is. Um, I mean, I can't say that uh, eventually, I mean, people recognize uh, the value or need or whatever, and they also recognize some of the complications um, in, involved in terms of an accepted uh, 
geoid or whatever, the, the satellites themselves uh, represent as um, a, a, some kind of orbit, I think, that uh, can be described mathematically. And uh, so if, you, if that's used as a reference, that's kind of a geodesy question that's, uh, that is, is more involved and that I should try to uh, tackle or answer on this call or, or, or relative to this deal. The important thing is, though, we're back to it's important to compare apples with apples. Uh, records that are of the same time period uh, are, are necessary. Records that are complete, uh, meaning there's no uh, missing data, and because that'll change the slope readily. Uh, and, and because so there's such strong seasonal records, as you can see, even on this satellite record, if you take off the high of one or the low of one or the other, it, it can have an effect, of course, more or less, depending on whether you're in the middle of the record or at the ends of the record. But even then, uh, missing records or gaps present problems to compare uh, rates. The, uh, the other aspect is that it's best to compare them reference to the same datum. Excellent. And our last question is from Andrew, and it says, what are most important in the future investments for decreasing uncertainty in sea level rise response, um, wetland change models, and is it better evaluation data, more information on accretion, better high marsh, low marsh models, or models that account for more of the geophysical or biological processes. Well, that's a great that's a great question. There's a lot in there in terms of uh, you know how to improve um, existing models that we do have because in in all cases um, they're oversimplified in terms of the actual biological and geological processes uh, involved. In many cases. My personal opinion is that uh, a lot of what we're seeing in terms of, of wetland loss, particularly for me in Louisiana, where I'm, uh, is and, and an example that was given for Texas, is more about man than it is about nature. We've changed the uh, tidal um, constituents of our, our basins by um, digging deeper harbors, uh, having uh, deep uh, draft navigation canals further inland. Um, so there's a host of, of complicating factors beyond the, the more simplified, do I have good LIDAR? In the case of LIDAR, uh, some of that is still not as good as people uh, uh, indicate um, if you basically, uh, uh, in certain cases, I mean, I'm not saying in all cases, and but I think one of the bigger things that we need to understand is the feedback processes that are geophysical and biological that are much more complicated than, than what we uh, uh, have looked at before. Basically, on the accretion rate, people have tried to use SETs or, or uh, geochronology dating methods as a sole um, constituent that stays fixed or static over time. And, and effectively, uh, I don't think that's the case. I think basically, uh, plants are getting the message when it's higher than normal sea level anomalies to grow new roots and uh, factors that can complicate whether they do that effectively or not are still not well understood. In most cases, it has to, I think, is interrupted by conditions where we've impounded the coast, and which has been done in a lot of cases. So it's that's a great question. It's pretty loaded with a lot of possibilities, but I. I would agree that uh, we need a better understanding of our geophysical and biological um, feedbacks because the, the the better record shows that uh, because we got peat uh, marshes that in mangrove systems that have kept pace with sea level for the last thousands of years because we can date the carbon uh, proves or shows that there is a capacity to keep pace with sea level. It may be some more of the other things that we do in our coastal settings by way of management or interrupted um, uh, effects of surface runoff. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a host of, 
of possibilities that uh, were uh, groundwater withdrawal, all those things are combined to uh, aggravate or uh, amplify the, the possibility for uh, plant species to keep pace or to, to uh, uh, hold ground uh, under these sets of conditions. So. Excellent. Thank you, Tom.